got everybody here for presenting, so it's recording. So you can, yeah, just go ahead. Okay, let's go ahead then. So, um, welcome everyone, um, uh, and thanks again to UCD for hosting us today. Um, this is the second section of the TU Dublin current Zoomcast, um, and today's theme of consciousness concerns that of our continuous need for inspiration and motivation, especially during these times of disconnection, and it follows on nicely from what we were just talking about. Um, I think we've all experienced at some stage over the last number of months a, a lack of motivation and a lack of inspiration given the way that we've had our lives and our, our kind of routines disrupted um, and we're living in a more restricted environment. So today's speakers have been selected um, to try and bring through their inspirational kind of ideas and creativity to the rest of us. Um, Jennifer De Leonardi is joining us today. She's design director at Brand Bureau from New York. And Andres Stankazi is an architect who's working with the OPW, the Office of Public Works in Ireland. Both Jen and Andres are really passionate about design and architecture and their distinct relentless pursuits of the new possibilities that design solutions can offer to the world and to people. And to me, in that way, they're both similar in their tireless and perpetual uh, sense of dreaming. Uh, and that idea of being able to dream at times of um, stress or duress is so important to our minds and our creativity and our livelihoods. And we need people like Jen and Andres to share with us and spread their enthusiasm and creativity. So thank you both for joining today. Um, a short intro to our first guest, Jennifer De Leonardi. Um, I guess it's not often that you'd come across an architect with, um, uh, who, who uses, I suppose, the, the sense of smell of fresh rain and the taste of cinnamon and the sound of high heels on stone as sources of inspiration. Um, her Instagram and Pinterest pages are filled with rich colors, subtle textures, plants, people, unusual details, and essentially really evocative atmospheres. As an example of Jen's desire to share the way she experiences the world with others, I'm sitting here with my Le Labo candle, Santal number 26, which the smell takes me back uh, to a really early morning walk through the streets of the meatpacking district in New York uh, on a New Year's Day some 15 years ago. Uh, and it's things like that, that that Jen brings to the world that we live in and to the people that she meets. Uh, and she uses all of her senses when she creates new environments. And today she's going to be sharing with us uh, a recent design process that she's working on with her team that I believe is only two weeks in uh, about whiskey uh, in the unusual location of Austin, Texas. So on that, I'll hand over to Jendi to talk to us uh, a bit about whiskey in the US of A. Great. Okay, so I have about 80 slides. I'm going to go through them in a New York minute because I know we only have about 15 minutes for each of us. Um, so hello, we're Brand Bureau. I've got a few team members on the phone too. Let's make sure I can get through this. Um, we are a creative agency inspired and rooted in hospitality. We believe in creating remarkable experiences out of everyday moments. We are a diverse collective of strategists, graphic designers, and interior designers who thrive at the intersection of hospitality and design. Uh, we go by a few different aliases, of course. We can be called architects or interior designers, but we're also tastemakers, wordsmiths, culture vultures, creators, thinkers, storytellers, and dreamers. Um, we were actually born out of Avrico. Maybe some of you know the studio. They've been around for about 20 years. They're now international with offices in New York, London, San Francisco, and Bangkok, and ever, ever expanding into different territories. We were uh, started about five years ago when more and more companies would come to Avrico to have um, our expertise brought into either their brand or their new, uh, you know, territories or 
even just into different um, typologies that you wouldn't expect to find hospitality. So, you know, that was a really exciting opportunity. So we really branched off and really got a new collective of thinkers along with designers to really focus on uh, what brands need today for a modern lifestyle. We also are lucky enough to have our own furniture and lighting design studio that we run and operate as well as a hospitality group because we actually started a rest our own restaurants and bars about 20 years ago when the design studio was founded so we have a lot of insights on the operations and needs for hospitalities to hospitality brands to run smoothly uh, whether we are building brands or building spaces, we like to do it all from big ideas down to the tiny details, blue sky to blast, brass tacks. And our services include brand development, visual design, hospitality strategy, and interior design. We believe in hospitality everywhere. In this increasingly complex world, we believe that by tapping the power of hospitality through design, we can bring small moments of joy to everyday experiences, making the ordinary just a little more extraordinary. And our categories, as I said, we work in a range of different typologies. So of course we started in food and beverage and hotels and travel, but recently we've actually been working on projects for universities, for healthcare. We just imagined the, the hospital of the future a few years ago. So it's really fitting during the pandemic about being really proactive with our health and inclusive. Also thinking a lot about the healthcare worker as long as, as well as, um, the client themselves. So it's been really exciting to take all of this knowledge and start to cross pollinate um, hospitality and all of those notions into different industries. And I'm lucky enough to oversee a group of brilliant architects, interior designers, um, artists, as well as uh, you know, product designers for lighting and furniture. So today we're going to focus on our pre-design phase because we do all of the traditional design phases from concept through execution with construction. But given the subject matter today, we're really going to talk about a specific area of pre-design called research and immersion that our studio does. So research and immersion during lockdown has been very unique. Um, it's usually been a very immersive process, but how can you make it immersive when we're all isolated right now? Um, research and immersion is pivotal to creating successful experiences that are relevant in today's dynamic society. As designers, we need to better understand the nuances of location, discover programmatic opportunities that connects with the end users in a meaningful way. Um, these are images from our old office in Lower Manhattan in Chinatown, and we have stacks and stacks of books still sitting there, um, as well as all sorts of different mediums of exploration. But one thing that's really important to starting a project for us is hosting a workshop. And the workshops bring together key stakeholders and collaborators to brainstorm and share insights at the kickoff of the project. So Brand Bureau uses conceptual exercises to open up a dialogue about true desires and needs of the project that a traditional project brief rarely identifies. That was an image of one of the word storms we would do. And so a, a sample workshop brief, and we'll do a lot of you know, preparing for this, based on what the project scope is or what the, the question is we're trying to solve. And you know, we'll, we're, really, we're really thoughtful about who we invite to the meeting. We want it to be inclusive. So obviously it's going to be the key stakeholders of the project, but it could be um, potentially people in charge of operations, their marketing team, other consultants that we really want to get as much information and thoughts um, around the table as soon as possible. So of course we'll start off a workshop with uh, the project process to sort of talk about what we know in regards to that, but really start to establish what the vision and the objectives of the project are. Um, again, there's so many layers to this that you sort of want to hear it from everyone um, first firsthand and then start to dissect really what the true needs are. Um, we start to do a little bit of brand immersion. There's collateral they oftentimes give to us in advance that we'll sift through uh, from wherever they live, you know, within the industry, we start to do some competitive landscape work to really see who's doing it well, where's the competition. And we oftentimes ask everyone at the workshop to do a SWOT analysis on themselves. So that's the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. 
Um, always interesting conversations come out of that because uh, you know a weakness could easily become an opportunity if you shift it right. Then we really like to go deeper into the audience and understand who's using these spaces, who are you trying to connect with um, through the designs of these spaces. Uh, we'll do word storms just to start to understand what's the language of the project, you know, what's the lexicon that sort of emerges from everyone talking and start to document that and use that and understand it better. Then my team oftentimes starts with image storms or image sliders because, you know, a lot of people don't know how to talk about design. They don't, you know, there's these um, in, embedded biases towards what people like, but they don't even realize they have it. So even as simple as something of showing images that are dark or light and getting an idea of that kind of preference or minimal to residential. So really basic terms, but once we can identify like where they're comfortable, it helps us start off on a really good foot. And then of course, with every meeting we have, we end with next steps, just so that people have that foresight on what, what they're gonna be responsible for next or what they're going to be seeing next in the process. Um, site visits and team and a team dinner is the ultimate icebreaker to kick off a project in a humane way, but of course that's been restricted during lockdown. So we've had to find different ways of connecting with our teammates, our clients, and different user groups. So we've actually leveraged recently virtual tours to help us understand the operational needs and potential customer journeys for a remote immersion. This has been really helpful, maybe something you can consider since you, if you can't actually get to the site and, and travel's restricted. Um, we've also been doing a lot of phone interviews with locals and employees to provide essential feedback on how a design should work or what a community needs. This oftentimes is not included in a design brief. Um, we're always in New York, we like to multitask. So podcasts and audiobooks allow designers to multitask and learn about other perspectives, such as fringe groups impacted by the design they're working on. Um, so we always want to get other perspectives on the project and not just keep it too siloed with one individual, usually the designer. And then a competitive analysis and local news sources provide insights that are often overlooked by the design industry, largely due to stereotypes, preconceived notions, traditions, or esoteric biases. So again, the more information we have, um, the better we really think we can position the project. But keeping designers motivated remotely is also key for building strong teams and the ideas flowing. Um, we've had many team Zoom happy hours. This was from a few weeks ago. We had a, a Halloween happy hour. Um, and then, of course, using, using different technologies. Some projects actually have required us watching and diving deep into cinema and movies, but also we, we can find a lot of inspiration in these different formats. So uh, Netflix parties has allowed us to watch movies together remotely and chat about what we're seeing. Um, we've visited new online museums for inspiration together since we can't go there in person. It was really nice to go to the Uffizi recently from New York. And then whenever we celebrate after a big deadline or a, a project win, we try to support local businesses the best we can by having premixed cocktails sent to each person or bottles of champagne. We've even hosted a beautiful dinner from the Sonoma Valley for a client who was based out there and had a whole entire turkey sent to them. Um, it's been a long, strange ride and we're a bit sensory deprived, but being solution-oriented designers, we're always up for a challenge. So I wanted to use the rest of our time to just go through a project we recently kicked off and knowing like this is the way that we think and this is the way we like to start a project. Let me just show you what we've been doing firsthand. I'm going to take you through Fierce Whiskers. It's a tasting room in Austin, Texas. And as I said, we just started this about two and a half weeks ago and we had a successful workshop remotely. So Austin is an inconsiderable village with a large expectations, full of misfits and outlaws, costumes of every variety, fierce whiskers, gaming and drinking abound in all quarters. This was a quote from about the early 1800s from a diplomat uh, out of the East Coast in their first visit to Austin, which was at that time sort of the Wild West. Um, Fierce Whiskers was intended as a dig on the people of Austin, but it became a badge of honor capturing the spirit of the city and positioned a distillery that is proudly operating outside the premium whiskey establishment. 
And one of the first rules of branding is know your audience. I'm going to be a little bit empathetic here and just clarify where Austin is. Austin is in Texas. It's a big state in the, in the south of the United States and often known uh, for its cowboys and its cattle and the oil industry. But it's changing. You know, we don't want to take those preconceived notions too far and stereotype this group of people, especially when we're from the East Coast. Um, so it's a new landscape for Texas Rangers. Uh, over a decade ago, a lot of industries in Silicon Valley relocated here because of lower rents, more space, uh, a healthier lifestyle. And we're seeing it booming even this year, uh, more and more people working remotely and growing their headquarters here in Texas. Um, it's still a playground for misfits and outlaws. Many of you might have heard of South by Southwest, which started as a film forum or a film festival. And then it uh, started bringing music and art into the fray. And it's hosted every year, along with Austin City Limits, which is strictly a music festival. So we really want to understand what the neighborhood is and what it has to offer. So here on that marker, you see where the site of the distillery is going to be. South Congress on the other side of the circle, sort of like the, the central hub of um, the community there in Austin. So it's only about a 10 minute bike ride. I know everyone in Ireland loves to bike and that just seems secondhand in America. Everyone drives. So it's really, really refreshing to know that you could bike to a distillery in the heart of the city that you live in or are visiting. So we'd be audited a bit of, you know, who are all of the food and beverage operators in this area? What are the hotels and nearby attractions? And then some of the first questions we start asking about the project are like, what are the demographics of the specific Austin consumer? So we'll go through, you know, get some data from online, understand really, you know, what is the complexion of the audience that we're dealing with? Understand a bit of tourism, because it is a very um, touristic city these days, at least it was when people traveled more. Um, what does the beverage scene look like since this is a distillery and a tasting room we're focused on? And then just some of those basic stats about what is it like to live there? You know, know where, why do people visit and then really breaking down our audience and a lot of projects you know, this is a quick one that we're doing so it's a pretty um, you know high level that we're really looking at our audience to understand who we're designing for um, other larger projects that have more time will actually think more about the, even the people that work there all the different groups involved so that it doesn't really feel one-sided again it's not about us as the designer it's about the people that use this space where we're trying to make feel comfortable there and so why is their distilling process special? I mean, again, in America, there's a lot of competition with different brands. We really need to understand and pinpoint what's unique about what they're offering. Um, anyone, I, I feel like I, maybe this audience is a great audience to talk about whiskey. Um, you, you sort of started the tradition, but you know, we created American craft whiskey, um, which ended up being uh, really tricky at the, in the you know, 1800s because you oftentimes had all of these you know, bad ingredients going into it to make it visually look good. And then again, increase profit margin. So quality became really important. And we had a lot of laws going into um, making sure that the, the whiskey being made in America was pure. So it's called the Bottle and Bond Act. And um, it just, you know, the way that we transformed that product um, into bourbon really um, started to signify it as America's official native spirit. So there's a lot of pride in the process of making this um, alcohol. And there's a lot of historic distillers in America America, um, specifically in Kentucky, where a lot of it, in, it was founded and started. So in, you know, in Kentucky, we have the Bourbon Trail, which is a, you know, sort of region close to Indiana that has all of the historic distilleries that really set the tone for what quality was and what, you know, the bourbon industry is today. A lot of it was founded on mythology and tall tales. So, you know, it's interesting to have to go through some of this historical data to really understand, you know, um, what still lives on today and these misnomers that just you know started with marketing um so kentucky it's, kentucky's about 15 hours away from austin so it's a very different region of the united states but as i said it's embedded in tradition people always want to take to take their production to this level of quality from kentucky bourbon there's a lot of statements that you know bourbon can only be made in kentucky which is again another tall tale similar to champagne but champagne actually should be made in that region this you know bourbon can be made anywhere it's a style of whiskey and so Knowing that's the history that they're really interested in and being cemented with and just like honoring tradition, how, how does this still set them apart in a competitive landscape? And through our workshop and talking to the client, it was really wonderful to hear him 
to speak of his history and energy and why he came to whiskey and how creating this new complex, this new production facility, he found it so important to make it a sustainable process. And that was not the easy road. And in America, we have a lot of um, businesses, large businesses, large distillers now talking about how sustainable their process has become. But it, that wasn't the reason he did it. He did it because it's the right thing to do, even though it was a harder thing to do. And so he's taking what was maybe a bloated process, making it more efficient, make it take up less land, um, always celebrating the local uh, supply chain from farmers and actually making it cyclical so that as they receive the grains, all of the byproducts go back as feed for livestock locally. As I said, there was a footprint reduction, making the processes more efficient, making spaces um, function in different ways. It wasn't just for one use anymore, using again, natural, natural energy resources, and even down to the details of the landscaping and the seeds that they were using to re the the land um, were native Indian grasses and native species. So a lot of thought was going, got taken into this project. It took about four years from start to execution of the new complex. Uh, it cost $10 million, which is, you know, really a hefty sum for all of this new equipment. Again, the new buildings, you know, dealing with the site uh, context and even just insights from the workshop to understand that it takes 500 gallons of mash to create three barrels, which are produced in one day. Five years will fill one rick house, which is one of the warehouses in which the, the whiskey barrels were stored. Uh, we'll show a little bit more about that. And then, you know, just really understanding all of this went into selling a product that is averaging $45 a bottle and just knowing that it takes three minimum years to start selling your product is a huge um, issue that we need to solve for and really celebrate and come up with a solution that can build hype and brand allegiance for something that's not available yet. So this was a statement from our client where they wanted to make a whiskey that they can be proud of, that Austin can be proud of. Um, so that may, meant waiting, may, waiting for the whiskey to mature, even though it's going to be difficult financially. And so along with um, getting a lot of information on the brand and the product, we start analyzing the site. So the architect that worked on the site provided a lot of great um, material here that I'll quickly whiz through. So this is the site here. Again, it's in the fringe of the city, uh, old industrial complex surrounded by, by trees. It's actually adjacent to a movie production facility, a new brewery is set up. So they're creating a creative community here um, that's going to become a destination, which will be very exciting to be part of. We had to understand the distillation process and again the, the size and the scale of each of the functions of the spaces. Um, again, siting the buildings were really important. It's really important to the Kentucky tradition and how they were the buildings were initially sited in a pastoral landscape, but that's not the case here. And again, we wanted to be super efficient and thoughtful about, you know, even any free everything from you know where the sun was hitting the buildings to uh, ideal wind locations. Once the site plan was established, we started to see the expansion plan here. You see with the the yellow rectangles of how the future rick houses could evolve over time. Only They only focus on building one warehouse to store the whiskey barrels and then they can build them as necessary in the future. We're focused on the tasting room and as you see within this distillery sequence, we are the end of the process. And we wanna really make sure that, you know, when people go on this tour and they see the product being manufactured and produced, that you know, we can keep telling this story in a meaningful way, really encourage people to linger in this tasting room, try different um, types of whiskey and different formats, but ultimately leave with a great memory um, and really feel like you felt comfortable there and you want to return. That's our ultimate goal in this space. So again, with the Rick House, it was a really important structure on the site and they went through the efficiency. You can sort of see in these models how all of the barrels are stored. Um, and there's a, there's a beauty to these Rick Houses. We didn't understand why they were black on the outside and it was because of the, the fungus that actually is cultivated through this process, this natural process. And, you know, we they don't have any type of built-in ventilation systems. It's all, you know, open ventilation and you want to maximize this fluctuation throughout the seasons because that makes a beautiful whiskey and you know the flavor profiles are amplified through this. Um, so again like the architects did a lot of ventilation analyses, um, massing studies, we received the Revit model that we started to dive deeper into 
And again, so starting to understand the circulation of flow on the site and how you would go through the tour and return to the tasting room as the, as the end of your tour. This is a study of the Rick House. It's a beautiful structure. It's a modern structure. It's really honest in its construction and materiality as well as its use. And then the architects initially were going to be designing the tasting room experience, but as the, as the client said, it sort of fell flat. It became too sterile, too functional, and they really wanted to bring someone who understood hospitality into the mix, um, who was a great collaborator. So we've had a wonderful time working with the architects and understanding what we can do with the space. You see the beautiful copper still that's from Louisville, Kentucky. It's a, you know, again, from like a legacy company that created this equipment that's been brought to Texas to create their whiskey on display. And so what our, our team has been doing is really thinking about placemaking. It's not about architecture, it's not about interior design, it's about making places that feel meaningful and significant. Um, so we already knew what the initial program needed to do. And you know, again, a tasting room is a very abstract term. So we needed to understand that a little bit more. So we know it's a tasting room to try different products. Um, they wanna offer food pairings, uh, but they also know in order to maximize this space, they wanna leverage it for eat private events, lecture series, community workshops. So it had to be flexible as well. Um, from the workshop, specific things, sound bites were emerging that were really important for us that we have synthesized here. We knew it was historic, it had to be uniquely Austin. They wanted it to ultimately to be the best Texas whiskey. But some words that really resonated a lot for us from a design point of view was the term uncommon. And then what the client said that was really intriguing was uh, when we asked him, what does success look like? He said he wanted to be the supreme of whiskey. And I don't know if you guys know what supreme is. It's a really, really um, successful streetwear company that has a cult following. So, you know, we were circling our wagons a bit about, you know, what does this mean for this brand? This is pretty interesting and unique. Um, so once we have taken all this data in and information and immer immersed ourselves in the site and the brand, we try to make a clear design statement because there's just so much to consider as a designer. And this was the statement we really wanted to, you know, celebrate as we go into a design and it's Fierce Whiskers. The Fierce Whiskers tasting room can become an outpost for fans of authentic Texas whiskey at the frontier of defining this identity. Fierce Whiskers can build a community around the appreciation of craft and conscientious production. So anytime we get held up, we go back to this design statement and make sure that what we're doing celebrates these notions. And another thing that we do for design inspiration, specific to Avrico and Brand Bureau, is start to really take aesthetic cues and start to like group them into what we call design pillars. And so there's an architectural pillar that we really thought was important from all the information we had gathered about Rick House functionalism. It was highly utilitarian and honest. That's something that we need to really come through and manifest itself through with this new project. Contextual can be quite misleading. We use it in different ways. So we need to build buzz about a product that's not available for three more years. And how do you get that brand awareness? And we really like the idea of being in the know and creating this founders club. And it's not a little translation translation of, you know, velvet upholstered furniture. It's the notion of being part of this community. So that's the programmatic thing that we're trying to design into. So that's what contextual means for us. How do we create a founders club here? And then we always like to have a, an artist or a craftsman as a muse. And so there's been a a lot of interest in the modern craft move movement. Uh, there's a lot of interesting production coming out of Texas that we want to tap into, creating uh, you know heirloom quality pieces, be it furniture, lighting, millwork, um, and then really look at those um, notions of hallmarks and trademarks, but also celebrate time and weathered patinas within this design process. So we'll break down what Rick House functionalism is to us as designers and start to really understand what that language is, that visual language is, what that material um, palette could be. And start to put mood boards together from pools that really resonate with us about, you know, again, I said this is very utilitarian vernacular from Kentucky positioned into Texas. Um, the Founders Club, understanding what those attributes are that we're designing into, what those nuances and details can be. Um, really looking at, again, this is a very traditional idea. We're going to do it in a contemporary, modern way, but this is a starting point. And some of those cues that we want to bring, bring forward, everything about legacy on display, ways to have personalized details for this Founders Club, um, the ideas of insider access. 
then the modern craft movement really celebrating um, how things are made. Again, it comes through with the furniture and the millwork, I said, and really doing things um, differently. So heirloom quality, but reimagining these classics in a modern way. And then we added to the mix, going back to that workshop and those interesting statements from everyone around the table, is we actually added a secret pillar to the mix. And this is not an aesthetic pillar, this is sort of how it works. And it's really the idea of hype beasts. So this came from Supreme, it comes from Kith, all these streetwear brands who are so successful. And they have that cult following. And a lot of the ones that are, you know, constantly obsessing over new products or obscure products that others can't get their hands on, seemed really like a great translation into this new whiskey brand, knowing that they won't have the product for a while. And so we really thought that the success of Supreme and becoming the Supreme of whiskey was not an aesthetic choice. It was how it works. It was understanding the mechanics of this brand about having insider credibility, um, limited release batches, and really hyping them up, uh, along with cross collaborations. That was the success to the Supreme brand and really breaking those things out into actions or ways to, you know, really build a community, set up events that are going to be meaningful on this site. Um, and so the question you would have after doing all this work and really getting immersed into the brand and understanding aesthetic cues is like, how does it all come together? And we start in the, imagining what this aesthetic could be, the different activations, how even the whiskey is presented through education. Um, and then we start diving in a little bit more into the site planning. So going back to what we had seen before with that expansion plan, really using the site in a different way seemed like a bigger opportunity for the tasting room to make people get used to coming here for different events and knowing that there's a huge music festival and film festival. Um, can we create a stage in the landscape that also can ho host movie screenings? So it's really great for COVID right now where you can be in the open air. Um, really tap into the food community there and like, you know, identify the starting point of the tour through a food truck so people really feel really comfortable where they start to gather potentially have a grilling area for for local chefs um, barbecue is really big in texas for all of you who aren't aware and um, really creating ultimately um, outdoor space for different types of events and potentially a pavilion uh, farther out in the property for things such as weddings or graduation party. So really maximizing the site as you don't need those rick houses for the, in, the, in the near future. Uh, we started diving into how do we make this space more flexible to really work as a founders club. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of garage doors around the perimeter of the tasting room. So again, open air is great. So you can bring this program out as necessary. Um, doing a few different studies and configurations. This is us leading into our Friday presentation. So this is really behind the scenes, but really trying to study like how the space works. What's like the obvious location of the bar and the back bar versus like, you know, what happens if we put it against the, that really um, powerful picture window with the copper still. It's an awkward configuration, but actually did a lot for us. It made the space more uh, flexible and also helped us tell a story against that north wall um, in a really heroic way. So this is really where we landed so far, doing a few studies, talking about what signature millwork means from a, a modern craft perspective. Um, and then also, even this early on in the process, we start thinking about art features and concepts and like, how does that maximize the storytelling of the brand and, you know, how can we use um, ingredients to talk about seasonality in the space or the tools of the trade and really celebrate them in a beautiful way. Um, I love the idea of textiles and craft and coming out of that community. So these are some patchwork quilts from Texas that, you know, might be objects that you can really uh, celebrate within the interior, as well as what does time stamped mean for us because that's a really meaningful attribute of whiskey itself and like the the legacy of time um so that's where we are right now i don't know how i did on time ending there but <laughs> no, that's uh, great Jen. that's great i mean i like we went a bit over um but uh i think you know to see a, such a an in-depth process um you know worked through rigorously and you know so quickly actually over the the last sort of 15 or 20 minutes has been wonderful thank you very much for that i mean i'm i'm i have to say i'm kind of struck by the intensity of the initial design analysis um and just how wide a net 
is cast. And I mm -hmm. suppose um, I, I'd be interested in coming back and speaking with you about how that gets distilled, excuse the yeah. pun, uh, but then like also that in contrast to some of the competitions that Andres is going to take us through as well. So if we can hold questions and move on to Andres now. Thank you, Jen. Thank you to Thanks your team. Thanks for your time, everyone. And then we'll come back to you after Andres has, has given us um, a, a, a whirlwind tour of some of his um, inspirations and ideas. Um, so thank you. So Andras, uh, I first met Andras uh, when he was interviewing for a part-time teaching position at TU Dublin some number of years ago and his passion for architecture was uh, just so obvious and present. Um, he has practiced over his while in Ireland for uh, a number of years with notable practices such as de Blackman Marr, uh, Gavin Doran architect, more recently Robert Burke and now he's with the Office of Public Works which has uh, quite a substantial portfolio of really important national projects um, but today Andres is going to talk to us a bit about what he does when his uh, his sort of daytime practice ends uh, and he he explores the alternative side of open competitions um, and I suppose if you just look back at the, the number and breadth of projects that he has contributed either through public exhibitions or international symposium, um, it's, it's quite wonderful, it's quite rich. And also, you know, there's this theme of intensity um, there. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Andres, to, to give us a, a, a 15 minute whirlwind tour of your competitions upon yeah. reflection. Thank you for the uh, the introduction. Um, I'm sharing my screen now. Hopefully you can see it. I'm going to start with one of the earliest projects I did. Um, this one um, is special because we, we, we had a chance. Uh, I did, did this with two of my friends um, and we were quite interested in doing competitions in the States because at, at the time there were a lot more competitions in the States than, than in, say, in Europe. And um, this one is special because um, basically we had a chance to, to not only to participate in the one that was organized by the University of North Carolina, but also um, submitted to the UN um, because they had a, a slavery memorial competition in New York and, and it, it got quite far and, and, and got into the top eight. And um, so first I'm gonna to talk to you about this one just quickly and briefly running through. So it started with a very strong concept. Um, we said that black boxes are peculiar devices that record and store memories that can only be processed through human intelligence. So we had a sketch and that kind of, that's how it all started. And, and basically um, we knew that we were gonna do a really introverted structure. And we knew that what we want to do is to fill these spaces with emotion and we started looking at creating these um, images, which I will show you later. And by images, I mean, you know, we, we were thinking of smells and, and scents and, and all, the, all the senses that you can um, stim stimulate. And, and, um, and then the other thing that I guess that we have to talk about when you talk about competitions is that they're, they're briefs. And for this one, it was quite extensive. There was a lot of history we went through it and and the, the competition asked for a location and we couldn't decide because we felt that there's not an appropriate place place to do this american slavery slavery memorial so we we were proposing that our location and site is actually an assembly diagram because we think that this should not stay in one place so this is just kind of like a, a brief overlook of this black box that we were thinking of and thinking of putting different things inside the, the rooms. And um, this is just the plans and a, and a long section through, through this um, black box. And um, basically it's a series of, of um, five spaces and there's buffer spaces in between. And then now I'm gonna show you uh, uh, quickly what kind of spaces we were thinking of. So this is this was our main image, our killer image. Every competition needs a killer image to kind of show what your idea is. So it's a it's a very um, cryptic box, and if you go up close to it, we 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 um, were imagining a, a timber-clad structure um, that's highly lacquered, so it's very reflective. But 
all the all the relevant people who were in this brief in this in this competition brief we, we stenciled them onto the facade so thinking that as time passes and this um, object is in place for four to five years um, then the exposed uh, areas will start to to fade and become more and more visible as time passes and then the first room we thought was thought about was we titled it the room of Rem remembrance and it's really just kind of like i think starting to think more like a sculptor rather than an architect so when you think of images and you think about the smells and we were proposing that uh, to put in charred beams and and um soft light so can, so to, to spark a sort of recognition to start to make you think about what you entered into and um I, I guess the other thing is that that's that's interesting about starting to think about as an architect about spaces this way that you're not really interested in the in the detail but more in the, the material composition of spaces and then we thought okay we do a room of the suffering and there we had a steel structure scarred and really intense light and highly reflective surfaces maybe not even pleasant to be in but you know some rooms don't need to be pleasant i suppose and then um our 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 idea about this room in the center the room of stories was that if if the 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 history of slavery is so vast and, and it's really difficult to pin down you know and have a good understanding of these things then we break it down into separate stories so what's cryptic on the outside and it's a stream of names there are touch screen devices inside this room and actually you get to maybe take home one story with you so you click on a name there and it will give you a story and and that was that was kind of like the key to the whole setup i suppose and then in the next room it was it was about segregation so we just put in a big, big glass wall because everybody th thinks of glass as something that actually expands your space but maybe maybe in some instances it is the thing that blocks you from moving through so it's a quite physical representation of that i suppose but um and then at the end of the of this of this linear journey you you um reach the room of equality and it's basically we propose to have a long bench and the idea was that this is the the moment when you may meet the people who you came came to visit this memorial or even people who, who just meet there you might sit next to one another and that would be the place to to have a discussion about things and um this was our last image for the uh, competition and um we we're saying that if you have a, a a memorial it should relocate every four to five years and people asked us, uh, um, when we were presenting but why not you know immediately and he said that uh, if you have um an if you're looking for mobile architecture, the best one has already been invented and it's called the car. Because um, if you leave something in place for a couple of years and you remove it, then you start to miss it. And I suppose we were saying that the um, that plinth that remains there, that, that could be a place for future uh, memorials. The next one I'm gonna much quicker show you through is the, is the Chapel of Red and White. It's the Guinness Memorial, Memorial Chapel for the, um, the victims of the Kachin massacre. And um, the thing to know about Kachin is that it's, it's a forest in Russia and that's where um, around 20,000 um, Polish people uh, were taken in 1940 and they were executed in that forest. Um, and to further the tragedy and that this was kind of like in the brief, uh, in, in, on the 70 years anniversary of this um, event, the, the Polish uh, president and uh, his entourage um, had a plane crash, so 88 people died. Basically, again, just decimating the highest ranking officials in in Poland. So um, this this plane crash happened in a foggy environment. So uh, I suppose the one thing that started to excite me about this is that how do you how do you start to design something? In such a symbolic context, and also kind of reflect to this natural environment, the fog, and um, and so it, 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 the design came to this 
kind of slender and 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 small structure that will have some sort of a small scale monumentality and um something that's that uh doesn't want to compete with the forest itself and i suppose this is the, the one thing that i wanted to talk to you about is the, is the drawing like it's this is a hand-drawn thing that was scanned in and then um the background to it was added in, in photoshop later reduced to try to get that sort of effect of 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 the fog around the building so this is the plan of it it's very simple i usually design for competitions very simple things because these are works on the side but i, I would try to explore the details so there's a, a, a reflective pool around this building and you you um go down the steps into the space that's a section through it and i suppose when you have so little to work with because you propose not to build too much then you start to look at the things that really excite you and one of them was the roof and the roof um i thought the, the area that's that's now in in colored in red that's you know like what what sound does your roof make and you know could you if i don't put a, a bell against this chapel maybe then then what i have is a drum and um how can the geometry be designed so that it actually if there's rain and it patters on it, then it will sound this uh, chapel so you can hear it from a distance. And the other thing about the, the skin, the building skin is, is um, I was interested in filtering, um, but filtering also in the sense maybe that filtering the fog, because um, um, the rascal mesh, um, sorry, so first I just showed the, the roofs. This is just a view of the, of the roof structure. And then this is just a close-up of the of the of the mesh. So so this is a um, um, a plastic mesh, and basically that you know you would put in uh, bags of uh, potatoes or, or or whatnot or 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 clad your um, um, sorry. So but yeah. So and, and basically what 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 this can do if if you have a double layer of this rascal mesh, then you can start to um, filter fog water. So um, in, in South America, uh, in areas where it's difficult to access um, water, they would be using these as, as fog catchers and they, they filter down the water into potable water. So this is the, the kind of like the design choice for the, for the, um, for the mesh. And that's, that's a view of the, of the chapel from the inside. And as you can see, it's, it's an all white structure, very slender and very minimal. And um, we've then here, I thought that, you know, the, it becomes a memorial chapel. So you don't just put something there and maybe that's through maintenance. And then um, this is your chapel of red and white. The next project is titled Retreat Shelter Nest. And um, this was uh, a competition in Sweden uh, at, at the high coast, and basically, it's a it's a nature reserve. There's lots of birds uh, that you can see here, and it's it's a quite a unique setting because uh, you have this um, Nordic gra granite that steps down uh, in very strictly. So um, I guess I was interested in it because I, I I thought the pictures of the site were quite beautiful, and uh, I. I was I've been thinking about how to put things in in nature but you know as a light touch and I was also kind of thinking maybe the clients are the birds in this instance not just the humans or as much the the birds uh, as the humans and um, so I, I I didn't have too much time to do this but um, I'm I I live in the suburbs so I take a dark journey and so I scanned my sketchbook and made the the, the sheets from this. So just very quickly what the idea was. So I was thinking about trees and there's a fallen tree on the very first image if you look at it. And I was just kind of thinking, okay, so I take that tree and then I rearrange it into architecture. And you know, when you when you process a tree, you, you're kind of in control of how you want to do it. And I was thinking if, if you cut them into the to logs, then um, maybe you leave a side where you don't limit. So, so there will be uh, branches there, and then you know there could be maybe little openings in this uh, in these logs, and you know then you have this sort of playful. You can arrange it to whatever way you like it, and I'll show you what I was thinking of. So it's a very simple um, 
proposal again. It's an A-frame structure, the simplest thing uh, that you can have. And um, if you make a roof, then obviously you start to think about what happens to the water that drains from that roof. And I was thinking, okay, you start to collect it. So I designed this um, barrel that adapts to the ground and I put a, li uh, a little ladder into it. So no matter how full it is, my second clients or my primary clients, the birds can drink from it. And um, this next, she just showed how easily something like this could adapt to wherever you place it. And then it really becomes inseparable for the, for the you know, where you, where you actually decided to put it. This next, uh, she just shows the, um, how it's put together. So the idea was that it's kind of like a, um, a, a massive timber construction and, you know, with the so-called bread up technique, you, you, you dial one piece to another. And, um, you see, there's always a, a space below these structures. So I was thinking about putting the, the shelter to the edge. And then what happens is that between the, the actual granite and this roof that's, that, 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 is, that ascends down, there will be a place where, where it, it, it can become a nesting place for birds. So um, as you can see, it's a really small room. I wanted to keep the space minimal there and um, with a tiny opening and a rectangular door in it. And the idea was that obviously you need to ventilate these spaces quite well because the smaller spaces, the more of a chance that you suffocate in there if there's... <laughs> so, um, but I wanted to double up on, on, on the idea of ventilation and, and that was basically co coming to this idea of, of, of having um, the ventilation opening as a pinhole camera. And then whatever life is below you, you will start to see the life of the, of the nest projected onto your ceiling uh, in there. And um, I suppose, you know, like you really need probably a retreat in winter time if you get lost or, or whatnot. And these branches will act like um, snow guards and snow is a, is a fantastic insu insulator. And um, if you have a tiny space, then, then it will, you, the, the warmth of your body will keep the, the, the space inside warm. And um, the, the last sheets were just, I guess, the clients who I got to know uh, through this project, sketches of the birds that I, I know that, that visit uh, this location and just the main image, I guess, of the proposal itself. Now, Pavilion in Three Verses. So this, is, this competition was for um, a poem and I'm Obviously, I'm not native, as you can tell, and uh, so uh, reading poetry in English is something that's that's that was kind of exciting for me from the from the get go. And and um, so there's this reoccurring uh, sentence in it in, in this poem, the Lake of Inishri, that that I will arise and go now. So I knew that I want to do something about movement or encourage movement with the structures that I, that I, I'm going to design. So the three verses translated into a reciprocal structure, um, which is laid over um, an equilateral uh, triangle. And um, so basically one element rests onto the other, and that's how it reaches equilibrium. And then I did um, a massing model for this. Um, and then when I saw that this is actually going to work, then I started thinking about how to detail it because I'm really into filigree structures because I think you have more control of what's happening inside or in between the the external face and the inside face and um, I suppose there's always an image that you look for and in this one it was um, it was a, a, an old ethnic space I guess that, that I, I was looking for and uh, the structure at the bottom is, is has a K brace and and I, um, the thinking was that you fill it with earth above and then you put planks on top of it. Um, obviously you need some weight for these uh, structures to, to anchor down. And also it's, 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 it's very evocative of, of that sort of environment that I, would, that I was thinking. And um, so that's it um, as it's kind of like a structural model. And um, this section here just shows the the end result, so um, um, you would walk up inside the structure and um, read one verse of the poem and then move on.
to the next one to read the other one. And materially wise, I, I suppose it's just weaker work and and um, rendered clay on the inside towards the end to bring you light down to the book. Okay, in, in this ne next one, open roofs. Um, so this is a this was a, an ideas competition. Um, what would happen if if you had a thermal bath in Carrara, which I thought was fascinating, and the the um, this turned out to be um, more of a, I guess, my love letter to Miss van der Rohe in a way, because um, you will see the structures I, I designed. I just thought that whatever you do there, it has to be quite minimal. And um, so I was thinking of a roof that would cover one of the, the these um, um, openings that are cut into the mountain as the as, as it's being extracted, um, uh, the, the stone is being extracted. So this is a steel grid. And um, basically, if you imagine um, a suspended bridge structure, but that's it, but in, in both directions. And because of the summer, you would need to cool it um, because steel structures would tend to move and you want to make it stable. And then this roof in turn would become a large scale shower head. So these are just the details I, I drew for this project because I haven't really done any suspended structure before and I thought that this would be, would be an interesting uh, exercise to, to look at that. Just uh, an image of the structure from above, from the surface and what it will enclose from below. And then um, I think this is my last one. I quickly uh, conclude on this. This one is called Collective Polyphony and it's a lighting design competition, something again that I have not done before. And um, I think thinking about light is always a part of, of a job of an architect, but, um, but I have not really done any public space lighting before. And um, this brief asked for basically uh, a way to control light in the public realm shared by many people and um, this was the sheet that was submitted for the competition and the idea was that you would plant um, you would plant touch controls and these touch controls they, they would measure the resistance of the human body which is unique to each individual and it also differs depending on the amount of of of, of surface skin that that you and and top of skin that you have that, so, so this it's kind of like a measurement that would differ uh, from pe from person to person, and um, if if there are multiple touch controls and multiple people touch it, then it means that you can add these resistances together and start to control light this way. And I suppose then the question was, but how do you get the base settings of this of this lighting? And um, in Dublin Bay, there's a, a smart boy, and basically it collects data about wave height, wave period, tidal levels, and water temperature. And that was that was proposed to be used as the basis of the of the um, of the light formation. And now I'm just going to show you a few kind of digital paintings I did after studying what uh, light looks like when when it's illuminated. And um, this is just shows one of the the lighting elements. So it's, the, the light is cast onto the onto the wave. So it's something that doesn't want to reach far into the distance, like a lighthouse. It's it's more something that's close to the shore. Um, the location is Dunleary, um, and I guess the one thing I can say is that I did a project in UCD that was not really successful, and because uh, I couldn't really find the right brief, and that was probably one of the things why I chose this location because you have to spend very little time there. That's it. That's it. These are the projects. Um, I was amazed at just how brave Andres you are and just going for things like, you know, you say, I've never done poetry, I've never done lighting, but that excites me. And then you just go for it. Uh, and you use your architectural mind to kind of work through the, the areas of interest or how you create these kind of memorable and meaningful designs. And it's, it's, uh, those are just wonderful. And thank you for sharing with us.
Um, I guess I'd like to just take a few minutes before we move on to the student segment and, and just talk about some of the, the intersection, I suppose, between both of our guests today. Um, I've written down a few things and, and I suppose um, one of the things that really comes across in both of your works is this sense of um, sensory memory. Um, and, you know, uh, I suppose both, you know, hospitality in its own right as an industry would very much play to those things. But then, you know, if you're talking from the Brand Bureau perspective about the industry and it distilling down to uh, an essential human experience, um, I suppose, Andres, you're kind of working from, um, as you said yourself, a really um, a, a detailed fascination point of view kind of back. Um, and I suppose uh, it, it's just seeing such different approaches to processes, but using, again, all of the talents and the things and the gifts, I suppose, that we have as architects and as designers to draw out that human experience and that imagination. It's just, it's incredible. So I suppose my, my question to both of you, um, because on the one hand, you know, Andres, you're your sketchbook layout of the commute and how you actually developed an entire competition response during your commute um, was really impressive. And, and Jen, I know, you know, your commute in the work that you have done over the last, you know, number uh, of years has been a, an international commute where you've been on a lot of planes and you've been in a lot of different countries. And I suppose going back to the purpose of today's session, I'm really interested to hear how, you know, without those commutes as such and those kind of downtimes in the way that would have been constructed for you, how you have continued to thrive and find that kind of inspiration that you've both brought through in your works. So I might start with, um, with Andras and then go back to Jen, if that's okay. Yeah, well, I suppose I'm in a unique position as an essential worker because I have to commute. So, um, but um, I would say that, that um, you know, I think regardless of, 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 of what's going on around you, um, I think competitions, for example, for me have always been kind of like a sort of thing that, that they were never the main thing, you know, in my life. And they were always at the back of my mind if I read something that interests me. And I guess the more time you, you, you do these things, the, the more it's just kind of like becomes a natural response. So it's, it's very easy to, to find the time and sit down and, and do it. I think one of the things that that's probably one of the best gifts after you do something like this is that you, you learn how to, to switch quickly to a mode when you need to produce something and you, 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 even if you th think about things and something is in the back of your mind, you don't necessarily need a table. You don't necessarily need an office. You don't necessarily need a, a computer, you know? So it's, and I think that's, that's something that, that is very difficult. Well, I found it very difficult to develop in the beginning. And I think it's just, if you, if you continuously start do these things, then, then it kind of becomes easier. So. So practice, 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 and just go for it, really. You know, it's kind of like your bravery where you just kind of dive in and say, I haven't done this before, but it's not going to stop me from doing it now. Yeah, and I think, you know, if, if, I, if I can say something to students is that mm. it's what, what's kind of fascinating is that, okay, so you, you, you participate in these competitions and it's really, really a, a, a kind of like a, an exhausting process and you might be up against, you know, a thousand people or 1500 people or 500 people, but at the end of the day, if you, if you put in the work, you know, eventually there will be results. And then, you know, they invite you over to New York and, you know, you, you represent Ireland at, at the desk. And then you sit next to these guys who come from all the Ivy League schools and you have to realize, you know, that things are not that different, you know, like they, they just another, another set of architects, you know, and you, you can have a really nice chat with them. Mm -hmm. Cool. Jen? Yeah, I love Andres' personal explorations, definitely during the commutes, and it, I think it's funny because your work is poetic, you know, you may not have explored poetry much, but you know, what you're creating is quite poetic in and of itself. Um, you know, I think we've spent a lot of time with ourselves during the pandemic, and it's easy to get in your head. Um, so oftentimes, like, you know, something we talk about in hospitality is building empathy 
for the user because it's you know the architect oftentimes you know if you think about the Anran ran fountainhead point of view and it's like sort of the the lone visionary and the work that they create there's a there's a place and time for that but you know for commercial work where you're really trying to bring so many people together and make them feel comfortable you know i really like the analogy to you know immersing yourself into a program or a brand um, that builds the empathy for the user is very similar to becoming a character actor and really you know the process that Daniel Day Lewis or Joaquin Phoenix will take on to really understand who this is for what their lives are like um, and like how does that change the way you react how does that change the way that you approach each project because different demographics are so inherently different you can't do it the same way in every location and every every place so I think that's what you know, keeps that fire ignited and, and keeps the curiosity going and just documenting as you're exploring the world or your community or even just your neighborhood block. Um, what are those aspects that you're noticing that are quite different and how can you use it in the future? You may not be able to use it for a few years, but as long as you're absorbing it and aware of it um, and just realize sometimes that design isn't just about ourselves and it's really for the people and, and their needs. I think that's really important right now. Um, in the world that we live in today. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you both very much uh, for joining us today. And thank you for sharing with all the students uh, and all of the, the people tuning in later on YouTube. Um, I have found your, both your presentations just um, wonderfully rich in very different ways. And I, I hope that um, others have found that as well. Um, we're going to go now to Alana Brunton, um, who is joined by a fellow student uh, in fourth year at TU Dublin, and they're going to um, talk through their short segment on 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School as a way of sharing and again creating that common ground between all of the different students in the different universities across Ireland. Welcome back to Common Ground, the student segment of the current Zoomcast. I'm your host, Alana Brunton. Hello again. This is day two. Um, so the vision with these Zoomcasts is that they'll eventually be student-led. So this is a little segment. It's relaxed conversation, sharing our experiences across the architecture schools in Ireland. Tips, skills, lessons that you picked up along the way, applied to projects, maybe put in your sketchbook, drawings you've created along the way. We are grabbing pieces from projects all the way from first year to fifth year and even at master level. Again, I want to reiterate that we're welcoming students, educators to come on the segment, have a chat with me. Um, please do input questions or contributions into the Zoom chat or do contact me on my student email and we can talk about future opportunities on featuring on the segment which would be really exciting. I will, I introduced the segment on Monday but I'll just do again a quick recap on who I am. I'm Alana Brunson and I'm a first year MR student in the Dublin School of Architecture in TU Dublin. Now common ground Welcomes to the hot seat, Philip O'Brien. Thanks for joining me, and I'll let you go ahead with your introduction. Uh, thanks for that, Alana. Uh, my name is Philip O'Brien, and I'm currently a fourth year student on the Bachelor of Architecture program in TU Dublin. It's uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks very much for coming on. So, Philip, you have done a bit of prep. You've brought point, uh, a specific lesson from today. Again, this segment is inspired by the 101 things that I learned in architecture school by Matthew Frederick. Yep. Uh, and you're going to look back a little bit on some of your design work. Uh, you can talk us through your experience. We'll see what comes out of it. And no doubt, I mean, it's going to be something that everyone watching will be able to relate to in some way, shape or form. So without further ado, I'm going to share the Lesson. Lesson 29. Philip, take it away. Uh, yeah, so basically from reading back through this book, um, you know, I, I went through all 101 and this one stood out to me 
the most because I just think it's really important. So basically, you know, it's, it's there on the screen. Being process orientated, not product driven, is the most important and difficult skill for a designer to, to develop. And there's a sub point in there, which uh, again really stood out to me is accepting as normal the anxiety that comes from not knowing what to do. I think that's just uh, really important to remember because we all get it, you know, uh, you're just given a brief, it's a little bit overwhelming and you kind of just got that, oh God, what, how is this going to look? Like it's 100% okay that you don't know in the moment, I'm going to do this, I'm going to follow this line of inquiry. But um, yeah, I just think this, this point is just really important. And from reading back over it and looking back at my own work, from first and second year, I had it on the floor of the bedroom. It was like a trip down memory lane. It was, this point was very much in my mind. It was like, God, I remember first getting the brief for this library in first year and, you know, being totally overwhelmed. It was all new, but then just something nice about looking back over it and you're able to see where you, you know, the product from start to finish. So, yeah. um, I just, I, you know, you, you know yourself, Alana, like we all get that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I might add as well, Philip, in first year, for sure, we're all kind of, when we get that first brief, um, it's definitely something, it's the first time you're experiencing this kind of um, venturing into the unknown and trying to get an idea rolling. But I think it's important to note that across first year, all the way up to fifth year and beyond, you, you grapple, I think, with this every year. And even in a sense, when you come to certain points in the project, you you have you know you have a great run and then you you kind of get this anxiety of kind of not knowing where to go next or you think I need to run yeah, the you idea hit that by brick wall. yeah <laughs> yeah and you need I need a second pair of eyes on this I've been I've been thinking about this too much you know in my own head or a, a new a new part of the project is hitting it and you're not sure where to go so I think it's something that everyone every architecture student tackles in, on many occasions definitely relate to yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and we might take a quick look um at the some of the sketches that uh, you're bringing forward today so i know you've thrown a few together if you want to uh just take take us through these yeah basically um i suppose i love butter paper i worked solely on butter paper for most of first and second year but unfortunately a lot of those sketches uh, are not digital yet. I suppose I probably should get around to sticking them on. But uh, this is just from a couple of weeks ago and, and you know, we're still in semester one where I just had to, to declare my stance on a certain topic. So it was just a brainstorm. Like I didn't go into this with any any preconceived idea. I literally yeah. just started drawing. I knew in my mind what I was what I was thinking and it was just drawing and kind of eliminating any white on the page. Um, because a white canvas is endless possibility, I suppose. So mm -hmm. again, a back to, again back to point twenty nine about the anxiety of not knowing what to do. Like, you know, even a fourth year, I still had that. You know what I mean? I was given this uh, this brief, looked at the page. I was like, right, I need to start writing down. I need to draw something, which yeah. uh, I think we we will discuss a point point ninety nine in a moment, which is about just doing something. So um, yeah, this is really straightforward. It honestly didn't take me too long. You've done your plan. You've done your kind of 3D axonometric type perspective, a bit of section drawing um, and, it, and kind of the, some of the um, sketches like the low running costs um, are almost kind of cartoony or graphic novel, which I, I, I really like your slant on that. You know, it's kind of we, we all we all sketch in our own way, bring our kind of personal. Helps the thought process. <laughs> helps the thought process. Exactly. Um, even your kind of even your lettering I have to say I must commemorate you but that br that brings us on then to kind of you were saying about looking at the blank canvas and again endless possibilities but you eventually have to put some put you know translate your thoughts and put them onto it to forge your project which is what we what we learn or I presume that's what I take from it so we'll go to you said this marries well with uh, lesson 99 so we'll jump 70 lessons here to just do something. And then you were, we were more or less discussing that, you know, you don't let the kind of light bulb moment or the clarity come before you draw. Like we're, as we draw, we're learning and resolving the problem. 
it doesn't come just sitting down staring at a blank page the ideas come from when you're actually sketching and i'm sure we've all had our eureka moments mm -hmm. in studio like i remember one time i had a big one i actually stood up and i was like this is it i'm finally getting somewhere because i was so frustrated and i was mm -hmm. you know it was great to be able to like stand up like yes i have something i can move forward with so like you know celebrate it i'm going to bring it now to some of my sketches i'm going to throw it back to first year um, kind of the first time as you mentioned Philip that you kind of grapple with with this brief um, we had to do a housing project uh, in Limerick City and the first thing I was issued with was a precedent so that was the Kingo houses by Jorn Utzon went found the information and analyzed it as best as I could and analyze sketching again is a great way of of analyzing it and I think again I'd, I'd like to point out that it is nearly a relief in sketching out someone else's project especially a celebrated architect like Jorn Olsen because the problems in a sense are resolved but you're just trying to find exactly what they are and get a deeper understanding and you could you know your shadows are hitting you know you're you're just your antennas are on you're you're thinking more deeply you're imprinting the space in your head i suppose when you do draw the floor plan yeah. or even draw like draw the floor plan and then maybe you draw your own axonometric from you know from what you've learned mm -hmm. from the building say like you've looked at the floor plan and then you know it's always handy to just do a really quick little quick atmospheric you mm -hmm. know the windows in the corner the bed in the corner you know and it's, it's kind of I, I just find it really helps from just staring at pictures on pinterest mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah exactly interest is great you know it's but i think definitely to be yeah. more in depth you should kind of just look into the building a bit a bit, a bit, a bit more you know well for me anyway that's why i, mm -hmm. I, I, I find it helps <laughs> and then that uh, my my study again as you're saying like looking into the building more kind of brought me on to um resolving or or generating ideas for the housing project that we were doing in limerick city so my project started to use some of the concepts um again haven't shown the slide but uh, these these would be snapshots from my my sketchbook then that would have been working with uh with the building in context and i guess concept and atmospheric party drawings in a sense that the project is starting to um kind of layer up and become something um and then that would have this would have been a later stage in the project where I had so these would have been environmental sections that I that I took in in sketch form uh, through the project investigating daylighting getting a better idea of really what the orientation is um, where shadows are bouncing resolving you know my window concepts how how tall how tall the window should be really simple things but not necessarily totally obvious to to one in the first ever you know design design process um yeah those, 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 i love sketches like that um mm -hmm. like i think they're much more like i think they're much more efficient in terms of representation compared to say if you're doing a, a daylight analysis and like sketch up or revit mm -hmm. There's something really nice about these sketches you know i i, I personally like doing them myself mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah taking it back on it to first principles because you're coloring in the shade yourself you know, yeah fourth year so again i think it's important uh this is again sharing my experience and and philip you sharing yours that i think it's it, it can be an awful pity that you know as you discover the techno all the great technology that it that can enhance your projects so just not to leave the sketching behind and forget about it and it is still um from my experience extremely extremely valuable and um, so this would be just a grab from my uh, sketchbook and fourth year. So we did, this is another housing project. This is one we did in Carlo. Um, I designed student housing. And again, resolving, trying to resolve the footprint of my building, the different courtyards I'm creating, how the form um, of the building itself can assist the external spaces throwing it back to Corbusier, a bit of plan, a bit of designing a plan and perspective, uh, getting feel, getting feel for the space, and um, again thinking, thinking through sketching to um, just get the ball rolling and and try and get out of the anxiety of not knowing where to go forward. Uh, that then layered up and got more developed. 
I was trying to design a very haptic space um, with small type courtyards um, with projecting uh, spaces coming into sort of the, kind of the, the, the boundaries between inside and outside becoming blurred and sketching through this idea again. A bit like first year, I started um, really in-depthly sketching out um, details of the building, looking at precedence, checking, you know, daylight, daylighting, shadow casting, but by hand and really making sure that I ticked all these boxes to uh, best rep represent the idea when it came to the final presentation. Um, to the fold, big scary render. A big scary render, um, showing this space in a real in a realistic uh, setting, trying to show you know the hap the, the the materiality, uh, the the kind of flow of people through coming in and out of the space into the student accommodation, how the kind of projecting pieces of of the building, a bit of space of social interaction, and um, the nook spaces into the small square. Um, yeah, people watching company that. That's what this is supposed to supposed to evoke. So um, I probably would, probably wouldn't have gotten to this had I had not, you know, explored so much uh, with the sketching side of things. And again, this was something that came out at the end for, um, uh, you know, this would generate at the very end um, to give to give a better representation. So layering, I think, cherry I think on it's top. just invaluable. The cherry on top. This was that that was the idea. The dressing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that was just, yeah, to read right back to the, the just do something and being process orientated, um, not product driven. So, so I think that more or less brings us to the end of the segment. Thanks very much, Philip, for sharing your two lessons. And like, if you're a fan of that book, then I do, I highly recommend this one, the architectural school survival guide. It's very similar, very, very similar points, but it's, um, it's worth it's, it's a bit of crap. It's worth worth the worth the read to be honest. Mm -hmm. Philip, you might come back on again and we'll maybe dive into a bit of the survival guidebook. I know I, I have recommended it. Uh, again brings us to the end. Thank you very much for joining me on the common ground segment of the current Zoom cast with TU Dublin. Um I I guess to finish off, I just want to say if anyone we're not closing the book on on less than 29 or less than 99 if anyone has anything they'd like to bring forward or come back on and talk about those topics please do i'd love to see your perspective on it um see if i can uh, relate to that myself again any other any other tips whether it be from this book or other books that relate to your experience again we all want to get a bit of dialogue going between the schools and uh, clear up that mystique about what we all all experience uh through our studies, uh, the good and the bad and the helpful. So uh, uh, please do let me know about that. Uh, but for the meantime, uh, this has been Common Ground and we'll see you on Friday. Thanks very much, Philip, for coming on.